to Living and Dying, the show about Brattleboro Area Hospice and what we can do for you and your family. My name is Richard Ewald. I'm a hospice volunteer. Our topic for today is hospice care. It's one of the three pillars of the programs that Brattleboro Area Hospice offers to the residents of Wyndham County. The other two are bereavement care, and the third piece of that is community education. Joining me here today are Ryan Murphy and Cheryl Richards. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Of course, you're here more than I am. I was going to say, welcome <laughs> your own self. <laughs> the other night, I was playing around with Google and typed an open at the beginning of an open ended question. And the open ended question was, when is it time to blank? And of the top four answers that started to fill in automatically was, call hospice. When is it time to call hospice? And I think that might be a good way to start this conversation about what hospice offers in the way of hospice care. To say, when is the right time? Do you want to start that with a bit of background? Well, no, we can, we can get to that, I think, in a little okay. bit. Um, well, the, the time to call hospice, and I need to make a distinction, we have a program we call Pathways, which is significantly different than a traditional hospice program. Um, hospice, under the insurance benefit that we often, we don't work with, but we work with agencies that do, the prognosis of a person's expected time before death would be less than six months. And as soon as you get that information, I would say that is the time to call mm -hmm. hospice because the more time we have to get to know folks and to have relationships build, um, the better things go. So the time to call would be when you get a prognosis of less than six months. Let me, let me add a little bit to that, Ryan. It, it depends on how far we want to be taking that question. In my own mind, a time to call hospice, this hospice, Brattleboro Area Hospice, would be, let's say you've got someone in your life, or you yourself has an illness, and you want to start getting some information about it. Mm -hmm. You want to know perhaps what to expect. Mm -hmm. You want to do some reading up on it. You'd like to talk to somebody. So that would be a great time to call hospice yeah, also. Absolutely. But for us, and we're a non-medical hospice, our, for the hospice program, it's a estimated prognosis of one year or less with a medical care hospice program, it's six months or less. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, it, it, it's important that our viewers understand that Brad Area Hospice is um, relatively unique. It is an independent, non-medical volunteer hospice with a very small staff. Um, and as such, we are able to develop programs as we perceive a need in the community. Okay. And you're absolutely right, Cheryl. People can call for information at absolutely any time. We respond to all inquiries. Um, anyone can refer to our hospice. It does not have to come through a medical avenue. And it, essentially, I think it's helpful to know that we have been in the communities of uh, southeastern Vermont and bordering New Hampshire since 1979, when a group of concerned community members saw a need and decided to create this hospice. And we've grown since that point, as you mentioned. There are bereavement programs, our outreach to the community in terms of education about issues involving death and dying, our library. So again, uh, there can be confusion because people think of hospice, they immediately think of medical care at the end of life, which is a piece of it. But we offer uh, programs that expand quite beyond that medical model. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. We work with the medical hospices in this area. Mm -hmm. We, however, don't offer that piece, but what we do offer is emotional and spiritual support for the family, for the person who has the illness. We offer practical assistance. We do the palliative type things that are easing the pain and the suffering that goes with uh, dealing with your approaching death. So much of what we offer, whether it's through our Hallowell Singers, whether it's through a volunteer providing companionship, whether it's through a volunteer walking your dog because you love this dog and you can't give it the attention you used to, these are the kinds of things we do. And we work hand-in-hand -hand with the medical hospices, 
but we also can stand on our own. Mm -hmm. And Ryan said earlier, anyone can refer. The person with the illness can call and say, I want to know about this. Am I, are you ready for me? Am I ready for you? Family members can, neighbors can, teacher can. It doesn't matter. We're here. Hmm. Another very important difference, um, for example, in our Pathways program, people can continue to, continue to seek curative treatment for their illness. And in a traditional medical model, that cannot happen. So people can be supported through volunteers for up to two years in the Pathways program and continue to pursue curative treatment. Yeah, it's do you, do you yeah, I, I, I think piece? I think I understand what you're talking about. Maybe if I turn that around, it'll make sense to me, and then or we can explain it a little bit more. One of, one of the things I've heard, one of the reasons people are hesitant to call hospice, is that it's a sign that they've somehow given up, mm -hmm. in some whatever that could mean to them. But it sounds to me like you're saying that someone could have a terminal diagnosis, still be seeking some kind of curative treatment but also receive the benefits of the physical and emotional and spiritual support. Right. That, that's, that's correct. Right. Yep, right. that's exactly right. And oftentimes we may not stay involved for a few, uh, two full years. We yeah. may, the person may improve and they might not need our support any longer, right. in which case we can simply wish them well and, and then if they need us in the future they can call again. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, somebody's been told that you have a life-threatening illness, that this could be killing you in up to two years. Well, most people when they're diagnosed with something like that are like, uh-uh, not me, I'm going for it, I'm going to do my darndest to get better. Fine. So calling hospice, there's the idea of that means I'm dying and I have to accept it. You can call us, we can provide support at the beginning when you're first diagnosed. A lot of chaos going on, a lot of upheaval, a lot of stumbling around how do I deal with this. We can be providing the emotional support around it then. Mm -hmm. The companionship, maybe some practical assistance to help you deal with it. And then you don't need us for a while. Perhaps you go into remission, you're doing fine, so we back off. Mm -hmm. Then let's say you get sick again, for instance with cancer, let's say you relapse. We come back in, you already know us, you already know the volunteers, it's not as frightening having to deal with strangers. Then let's say, you're doing fine, we say goodbye, best wishes, just like Ryan said, or let's say it does move into the terminal phase. You already know us. Mm -hmm. You are now eligible for our more comprehensive services that we offer in the hospice program. Yeah. Let, let me go to the point, you used the word strangers. Um, What, what, what's it like for someone, and well, let me ask that a different, different way. If I'm in this vulnerable situation, my, someone in my family is dying, how do I have the confidence in reaching out to hospice that the strangers who are going to start coming into my house are people that I can really be comfortable with? Yeah, so when, when you say that, what I'm hearing you say is, is what's the process like? Well, how do I if know I dare... that, the, that it's going to be a good match between our family and this person? How do I know? I, I have no idea what it's going to be like. Well, I think, right. So let's talk about the process yeah. of it. So. You, you, you don't know, really, <clears throat> at that point. Um, but through experience, and certainly through our years of uh, being in the communities, uh, in, not invariably, but the vast, vast majority of the time, people have a very, very positive experience and some wonderful relationships develop. But that takes uh, meeting folks and Cheryl and I are available, and what we want to do and do do is um, we'll think about, we do the matching of the volunteers. That's my, my question. I call 257-0775, right. and what happens? So let's, let's walk through the process of it. You finally get up the courage to call, all right? And then you're going to be referred to either Ryan or myself. We're the hospice care coordinators, so we're your first contact. So we'll talk to you, we'll get a little bit of initial information, what's going on and so on, and then we set up a home visit. And one of us will be coming out to your house, or let's say you're in the hospital or wherever, but we'll come out and meet you. As many members of the family, friends, whoever, who want to be present at that meeting can be. Some families want everyone there, mm -hmm. some people just want themselves. So we start telling you a bit more about who we are, what we do, what kind of services we can offer. 
all the time giving you a feel for us and, and we're getting a feel for you, for what you need. And then we'll come back to the office and we both have a sense now of who you are, what your family's needs are, what you're looking for, and we start going through our list of volunteers. Who are your neighbors? They're community people. They're people just like usins and you, and they're people who have gone through extensive training to be able to meet you. So we will then match a volunteer or more with you for what you're wanting. Volunteer comes out the first time, you meet, you talk, you figure out if it feels right. Volunteer leaves, Ron and I call you and say, so, how did it go? Did you like that person? And usually it's yes. If it's not yes, you, you don't have to feel guilty about, no, I don't want this one, I want someone else. It's, you know, personalities don't always click, needs don't always match, so we'll find someone else. And then we continue to supervise the volunteer and continue to connect with the family. And it's just an ongoing, unfolding relationship. Some families don't want much to do with the volunteers. They're, they don't have energy for it. They're, you know, they're closing in. They're needing to do what they do. So the volunteers can be in the background. They can be quiet and unobtrusive and just following whatever kind of needs you have. Some volunteers you become very connected with and make use of their willing ears. Uh, it just really depends on each individual person. But as you said a few minutes ago, it's an unfolding, ongoing relationship. Did, mm -hmm. Are there other pieces that you're wanting to well, add? Well, I just hear myself saying when I go to those initial meetings with families that all of our services are driven by their needs and what works for them. And, yeah. uh, and that's really how it, how it works. Right. I mean, people sometimes, again, getting back to the stranger aspect, um, I've seen some very seriously ill people that think they have to be on when the volunteer shows up at yeah. their home. Yeah. And uh, like a host, entertainer. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. was one fellow that, that, that kind of had that so badly, I had to go with each new volunteer and in front of them say, in front of him, say to them, now don't let him play host with you while you're, while you're visiting. That so it's driven by the situation and by the family's needs and desires. And Cheryl mentioned our, our training. Um, our volunteers go through 33 hours of training. They meet for 11 weeks, three hours a week. And I also usually mention that to people because I think it's telling mm -hmm. of the type of people and the level of commitment they make to, to provide this service and to do this work. It's one of the longest vol hospice volunteer trainings mm -hmm. in the country. Yeah, I, I know some of those volunteers and I've heard them described as, as um, being great listeners, they're non-judgmental, they're completely accepting. Um, are these people, where do you find them? I mean, it sounds like the ideal friend. Now, are they made Outside, or they born? they're on the streets. <laughs> they're, they're our neighbors. Yeah, they're yeah. next door to mm -hmm. you. They're and, the grocery clerk. And, and I think uh, most of us who live in southern Vermont in this area would agree it's a pretty exceptional yeah. area to live and the communities are very strong and those are the people that emerge who want to be part of the fabric of community. Mm -hmm. and, Again, going way back before there was insurance to pay for medical care in people's homes at end of life, it was neighbors helping neighbors to have the best quality of life for as long as they could have, mm -hmm. and also to be able to remain in their homes. I mean, that's really kind of the, the hospice philosophy really is um, that we have uh, physical, social, spiritual, uh, and emotional needs until we die. And so it's that period of getting the information that you are facing a life-threatening illness, and yes, you most likely are gonna die within a certain period of time. Quality of life becomes a major, major piece of what your thinking process needs to be about, what your decision-making needs to be about, and we try to help families to uh, you know, move through that part of their journey with as much support and recognition that they still are part of this life as possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you talk about spiritual, providing spiritual support, um, Wyndham County is full of people who of so many different religions or and no, people who have no religion, religion at all. So, what form does that take? Well, I would say it's very individualized. You know, um, 
you know, some people might be open to a, a, a question like, you know, so tell me something about your life. What, what has been meaningful to you mm -hmm. in your life? And, well, my, my, my Sunday morning time alone in the woods has been extremely important. I mean, there you have a spiritual context to continue to have a conversation. So it's very individual. It's very yeah, we're not, we're not following a particular religion. Mm -hmm. We're taking the more expansive view, I'd say, of our spirituality. Our spirituality is, or can be, everything about how we grow ourselves through mm -hmm. our life. So the way a volunteer can support this is to witness. Witness who that person has been, who they are mm -hmm. right now as they're dealing yeah. with their living, dying experience. Uh, perhaps asking questions or just being willing to hear the doubts and the fears and the hopes and the dreams mm -hmm. and the just letting that person for themselves unfold into their own spirituality. Mm -hmm. I believe that's the more expansive way that we Oh, I think at. you're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. We, we sometimes okay. will have people that just really have a, a very strong need to do what sometimes is referred to as a life review. Mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. move through their life and it's it's a caring attentive individual to share that with and um, that can be a very spiritual thing we're, we're focusing on the person who's dying but I want to say that here at Brattleboro Hospice we consider the entire family and the close friends the client so it's not just with the person who has the illness it's also mm -hmm. with the family members and people who love this person that we're supporting. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine too on a different level those family members uh, may have uh, questions about practical matters that hospice might be able to provide some, either the staff or the volunteers can provide some direction for them thinking about uh, <coughs> the documents of durable power attorney and, yeah. and what to do about burial and memorial services. Mm -hmm. and, are, yeah. Is the staff and volunteers equipped to steer folks through mm -hmm. that decision? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think so. Not each and every one in every situation, right. but certainly we network and, you know, our, our um, educator and community outreach person, Bettina Berg, has been taking a special interest in alternative funerals, for example, yeah. and what's yeah. involved in, in doing that kind of thing. I think also, Rich, um, in my experience, people who have never been through the death of a loved one uh, need good, solid basic information about what they might encounter. Mm -hmm. And I think that can be an invaluable right. service. Uh, particularly when someone is coming very close to the end of their life at home. Um, we have booklets that we share with them and just co through conversation. Uh, let them know what may occur mm -hmm. in those mm -hmm. uh, weeks and days and hours. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be a tremendous service to folks. Um, and we've heard that from many, many people over the years. Mm -hmm. Tell, tell us a little bit about how Brattleboro Area Hospice, which is a non-medical uh, service, mm -hmm. coordinates with the medical side of things. Sure. Um, medical hospices are required through, by law, really, the guidelines that they have to follow, mm -hmm. to offer and indeed have a minimal amount of their total service package be delivered by volunteers. Mm -hmm. Not everyone gets volunteers, um, but actually most people do. So when one of the home health agencies goes into doing admission, they always talk about, in this area, us, as being available to folks, and then they will send us a referral, and we will then do what Cheryl described a little bit ago, contact the families, find a time to meet, and move from there. And then we work collaboratively with the home health agencies. We right. meet regularly to uh, discuss cases and update one another on what's going on from our end. And so it's a very strong and close collaboration. The other thing that can happen is that we can work with families that do not have a home health agency involved. Oh, yeah. and may never want one involved, or down the road we will then refer them to one. So it goes both ways. Yeah, Yeah, and as we said, we can be involved with supporting folks for significantly longer than the medical hospices can be. So as Cheryl yeah. mentioned before, we have that much more opportunity to develop relationship. And oftentimes our volunteers have experiences which really round out who these folks are 
and what's important to them and what their lives have been like in a way that sometimes medical people just don't have the opportunity mm -hmm. to learn about. So it feels really positive to me when we're at a meeting and we can share that information with the medical folks that are providing that care. The other piece I want to add, uh, Ryan mentioned earlier that we work with people in their homes, and we do. We also work with people in nursing homes and in hospitals. You don't have to be at home to be able to get our services. What's a geographic area that's served by the Brattleboro Area Hospice? Pretty much all of Wyndham County and our bordering New Hampshire towns. Um, yeah, with that said, because again, going back to the fact that we have services that aren't available through medical hospices, we would go up into, say, Bellows Falls and that northern tier of Wyndham County. When, it were, when it's a medical hospice services, generally those services, including the volunteers, come from uh, Bellows Falls and Springfield in that area. Uh, same home health agency with whom we collaborate often, um, but in that case they would have hospice volunteers mm -hmm. from up there. But if somebody were wanting our support through Pathways, we would go and have gone up there. And then across the river, um, as far as uh, Winchester at times, uh, but certainly yeah, Hinsdale, Cushing, Chester, right, Fulton. Right. So it sounds to me like someone puts in that call to 257-0775, or they go to Brattleboro hospice.org and make contact and the Brattleboro Area Hospice can provide all these services, interrelated services, to the person who's dying and to their family. Well, how much does this all cost? Well, that's the good news. Absolutely free. <coughs> Don't you love it? There's no need to pull in insurance and look at no. your coverage. No, and we're not going to ask you about your insurance. We don't care about your insurance. We're not charging you for anything. So where does the support come from to keep this all going? I know that uh, Experience Goods mm -hmm. is a great, a great source of income. Mm -hmm. It's owned and operated by hospice. Our thrift shop here in, um, on Flat Street, downtown Brattleboro. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's Individual a donors and foundations. Well, that's where <coughs> the goods that we sell at our Experience Goods shop on Flat Street are from donations. Um, the hospice, this area of hospice, has always existed on donations and some mm -hmm. fundraising. Those are mm -hmm. our basic. We are a United Way member mm -hmm. and we get some financial support through that and the various towns in which we serve uh, at town meeting usually will you know identify an amount that they want to donate but it's it's through individual donations that basically. Individual and writing grants to foundations mm -hmm. and so on. Um, businesses. Right. But it's all it's all community support. Mm -hmm. It shows that we, we don't deal with insurance and never have. It's terrific. Mm. Yeah, people are surprised sometimes when they hear that. You know, the more I listen to you describe what the services are, I think if you, if you reduce it to the most common denominator that what Brattleboro Area Hospice provides for people are, are people. Mm -hmm. And we call them services, but it's various forms of people showing up to just be there and help in what any way they can. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, and part of our training is exploring our motivation to do this work and to be aware so that we can then become as authentically present to the folks that we serve. So we're aware of our own motivations. We're, 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 we do a lot in the training of, as Cheryl mentioned a little while ago, um, to be as fully present as we can. And as you mentioned, Rich, without our own agenda we sometimes refer to. We often talk about meeting people where they are. And, um, and that's something we continue to try to develop all the time. This is how humans used to support each other. I suppose it is. Live. And I, I guess, I mean, I've heard in so many different ways how, at least in this country, in the last 20 or 30 or 50 years, we've become disconnected from understanding that death is inevitable part, part of life, of life. Of becoming comfortable with it and, and understanding that it's an overwhelming experience for all concerned and yet we all do it and we don't have to do it alone. Mm. That's very, very true. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think back um, when I first uh, trained as a volunteer for Bradbury Larry Hospice, it was 1985. So, you know, it had been about six years since the beginning of this organization. 
and we were talking about, well, why, why do this work? You know, what, what motivates people? And um, one of the leaders of the training and one of our founding members, uh, Pam Mayer, said, perhaps because it's an opportunity to be with someone at what might be the most important moment of their life. And that's always really stayed with me. And also, you'll often hear the word among people that are involved in hospice as um, feeling privileged to join people at this time in their life mm -hmm. and to share this part of their journey with them. And to be allowed in is always um, very moving, very impressive, very, um, very, very uh, valuable in, on many levels. Well, thank you very much for allowing us into your life for this discussion. Uh, we've been talking here with Cheryl Rivers and Ryan Murphy of the Brattleboro Area Hospice at 191 Canal Street, right next to Burton Car Wash, 257-0775, brattleborohospice.org. Let us hear from you and let us know what Brattleboro Area Hospice can do for you. Mm -hmm.